Tonight we have the, the chairs to stop him, hopefully, from repeating that performance. Uh, Jeffrey is, is, uh, is from England. He's a, uh, a Lecrebusier scholar, has written uh, a fine piece of work on uh, Lecrebusier and, and really has an insight uh, to the work different from probably you've been exposed to before. And uh, we're really happy to have Jeffrey back tonight and I'd like him to continue on or start all over from where he began before. Jeffrey Baker. Well, thank you very much, Ray. And it is, of course, a great pleasure to be back here. And um, I must ensure that I don't move too far away from this place, which is a little wobbly, I see, just here. Um, OK, well, the lecture is entitled Le Corbusier, Nature, and the Organization of Form. OK. Le Corbusier, Nature, and the Organization of Form. And I'm actually going to explore what I think is one of the most significant aspects of Le Corbusier's work, and that is um, his relation to uh, nature in, uh, in a general sense, which of course occupied him throughout his life. I'd like to begin by reading to you something that he wrote uh, to some South African architects, and it's just a quotation. And he said, how are we to enrich our creative powers? Not by subscribing to architectural reviews, but by undertaking voyages of discovery into the inexhaustible domain of nature. Beauty first is the true lesson of architecture, and we find it in nature's adaptability, in her precision, in the convincing reality of the spectacle of her harmonious combinations and creations which she offers us in everything. A serenity of perfection that exteriorizes its own inwardness. It's there in plants, animals, trees, in views of seas, plains or mountains, yet even in the perfect harmony of natural catastrophes, geologic ca cataclysms. And this was written by Le Corbusier in 1936. And I think when we compare his architecture with that of most architects today, I would suggest that the main difference lies in his reliance on nature as a source of creativity. And he often referred to his own architecture as being what he called biological, because he felt that architecture should obey the same principles that can be discovered in nature, which, which he discovered. And he came to believe in what he described as a harmony between man, nature, and the cosmos. He thought that we were involved in one grand design, uh, part of something that existed throughout the universe. And in one sense, he saw nature in terms of its geometrical structure. So the combined ideas of harmony, this grand harmony in the universe, and the need to have unity in design became fundamental in his thinking and were expressed on the one hand, of course, in the orthogonal grid that we see here, the Villa Savoie. We've just been looking at a slide off. And this was a means of geometrical unification of his work. And then, of course, he evolved the modulor, the system of arrangement whereby all the parts of a building were linked to each other by a proportional system. Now, this architectural rationalization of principles which he discovered in nature is very typical, I think, of the intellectual approach to design which he used. And it's something that was apparent from the very beginning when he was educated as an architect in his birthplace at La Chaux de France. And here we're looking at the building in which he was born, in this apartment block. And it was at the local art school that he discovered a means by which he could penetrate beneath the surface of nature in a way that could be fed directly into his creative work. And that this happened at all was due in large measure to the fact that he was educated at the turn of the century when the 19th century attitude towards nature as a key source for ornament was still in being. But he was also very fortunate in having as his teacher Charles Le Platinier, a very young, enthusiastic teacher 
who believed profoundly in the principles of design that were advocated by such luminaries as John Ruskin, Grasset, uh, and Owen Jones. And Ruskin's books, his influential books, and of course he was tremendously influential in the 19th century, The Stones of Venice, The Seven Lamps, The Elements of Drawing, Modern Painters, all these books were in the library, listed in the catalogue of the art school library. They were all there. And a very important book was kept in the classroom. It was Owen Jones' Grammar of Ornament. And in addition to these excellent sources, of course, Le Platinier was a very effective teacher. He had his own method of penetrating nature by analyzing it through drawing. And he believed that, as they all did at this time, that unless one did this research into nature, unless one understood the structure of, of plants and, and flowers, the patterns and so on, uh, one couldn't be a, a professional designer. Ruskin, of course, saw architecture as an interpretation and glorification of nature. And he wrote, whatever is in architecture fair or beautiful is initiated from natural forms. We're looking at a couple of sketches that Le Corbusier, as he was in those days, Charles Edward Janeret, I should of course call him. He was Charles Edward Janeret until uh, 1920. Um, and here we have a couple of typical sketches where he's exploring the, uh, the, the, the flowers and making them into patterns. Uh, Ruskin insisted that there was a close relationship between architecture and nature, which meant that architecture too should be analyzed. He insisted that you analyze nature and architecture. And you could only do this through drawing. And so uh, this idea became very firmly implanted in uh, Jeanneret's mind through the medium of Charles Le Platinier, that it was only through drawing, following these principles that were actually put into being by Ruskin, that one could understand uh, how to operate as, as an architect. And it fashioned uh, Jeanneret's view of architecture and of nature from the very beginning. Well, I just want to look briefly at some of these sketches. Uh, we've got an interesting one here, which is uh, a, a, a female figure in a setting of foliage. And you can see that it's a very Art Nouveau representation. These were done around 1904. Um, Jeanneret was born in 1887. So in 1904, he was about 17 years old. And on the far side, we can see a pine tree with the snow. This device at the bottom here, and this, by the way, is a, a drawing from a sketchbook, say, about six inches by three or four inches. It's a very tiny drawing, really. And um, this method of doing a little postage stamp-sized uh, uh, summary of the content of the whole composition was something that Jeanneret did early on. Um, what he really was doing in these sketches was changing the medium, as we shall see, dependent entirely on the subject matter. And what is evident is an enormous flexibility of mind to attack whatever the problem was in the way that was most appropriate. Uh, for example, he believed that there was a total interrelationship in nature of all the phenomena, mountains, clouds, plant formations, all seen pine trees as part of a totality. And of course, this is what I was saying earlier, that Jeanneret believed, Le Corbusier believed, that we were part of this grand design. So everything then became interesting and fascinating, and everything had to be documented in an appropriate way. The sketch on the far side is a landscape in rain. And of course, rain is a very important phenomenon. The landscape changes. So there are several sketches of that kind. And this is a root formation. And we can see here that he's attacking it in, in, in plan and in section. And he does a small diagram, top right, in which you can see the kind of force, uh, the, the stresses, as this uh, plant is, is in the ground, we have certain resistance to, uh, it's actually on a slope, and we have that diagrammatized at the top corner on the right. Now, I want to look in a moment at the first house that he did in La Chaux de Fonds, in his birthplace in Switzerland. But first of all, I just want to read you something from Owen Jones' book, The Grammar of Ornament, because he traced 
uh, he didn't trace, he drew actually. He reproduced several plates uh, from Owen Jones' Grammar of Ornament uh, where he was drawing Egyptian ornament or whatever. And my slides of those are back in the UK at the moment because they're being used for a, a, a monograph on Corbu, so I don't have those. In fact, some of my better slides of the sketches are back there, but no matter. What Owen Jones wrote was this. He said, the creator has not made all things beautiful that we should set a limit to our admiration. On the contrary, as all his works are offered for our enjoyment, so they're offered for our study. They're there to awaken a natural instinct implanted in us, a desire to emulate in the works of our hands the order, the symmetry, the grace, the fitness, which the creator has sown over the earth. So if we think of this message coming from Ruskin and from Owen Jones, it was inspirational to an unusual degree, and Gianare was undoubtedly fired by what was an underlying spiritual and metaphysical uh, content of this message, on which both these, these men's teaching were based. So his first house, the Villa Thale in La Chaux de Fornes, that was designed by him when he was only 17 years old, built in those years, 1904 to 1906, around that time, built on this hillside, the Puilarel hillside, which I think I can dare to walk over to and point out. He, he made some forays to study the geological formations uh, along the river, and he sketched those. So we have this town, the gridiron formation. You can see Nurchettle, the lake, up at the top there. And his first house was a tremendous celebration of the majesty of nature, and he packed into it everything he knew at this time. It was partly constructed by him and his friends. They worked on the stucco decoration I hope this is in perfect focus. They worked on this stucco decoration together. And when we read Ruskin, he says that if we do anything with our own hands, we impart into it something very special indeed. It, 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 it transforms the quality of the work if we're involved in it. And it's not uh, insignificant, I think, insignificant that uh, Jean Ray worked on it himself. Um, it was also, uh, the working drawings and the construction was supervised by an architect called René Chapelas because Le Platinier knew that this young man, Janeray, who was only a, a student at the art school, was not really experienced enough to be able to do the supervision of this building himself or to do the working drawings. So René Chapelas did those. And I contacted Chapelas when I was in La Chaux de Fonds many years ago now, when Chapelas was in his 90s. I think he's dead now. And he wasn't seeing anyone, he was deaf, but I contacted him through uh, his niece who gave him a few questions and I asked him just how much uh, Jeanne Ray had done of this design and he said yes, the design was his, very much in the spirit of Le Platinier's teaching. Well, the symbol of the house was the pine tree, as we might expect. And we find that symbol expressed in the, uh, in the profiles of the gables and we find it expressed uh, in all sorts of ways. In this south-facing facade, we can see, again, the profile of the roof. We can see the triangular pine on this balustrade here. And there we can see a close-up of the stucco showing how the pine is abstracted and how, at the base of the structure, these, these props which hold out the gable, we can see, again, that we have this triangulation of the pine. It's taken up, as I said, in the wrought iron balcony railings. It's taken up in the strap work to the door at the far end there, the entrance, and it's taken up in the windows as well. One of the features are these lizards, which appear as the door handles. And this is one of the sketches that Jeanne did. And again, typically, as I was beginning to say, he explored these things in different ways. He used pencil and charcoal and a little wash for a drawing of this kind. And what he's capturing here is the essential, um, uh, what's the word, a sort of feeling of elasticity of this animal. That the whole animal is, is a totally sort of uh, fluid, elastic thing. And we really do sense that. If he was analyzing in, in something in depth uh, that required notation, he would do it very differently. But that was the way that nature became directly imparted into this building. And when he was sketching the geological formations, that became abstracted into pattern, and he explored various possibilities from the geological structures as to corner treatments, 
And the corner treatment is expressed, as you can see, on the far side, where we have this cantilevering of the dress stone, distinguishing it from the rusticated masonry. The expression of structure became quite important in the, uh, in the villa. We have the beams coming through, as you can see, and we have uh, a constant sense of structure uh, throughout. There are no major spaces in the building. It's a very straightforward, simple design, with the exception of the hall. And the hall, as you can see, is uh, going through two floors, a hall and staircase, and we have uh, an interesting treatment of the ceiling and an interesting uh, sense of craftsmanship which prevails throughout the villa, as we would expect in this particular part of Switzerland. So the Villa Fale proved to be a wonderful vehicle through which he could uh, crystallize these Ruskin, Owen Jones inspired thoughts about nature. Well, the next stage of his development came when, almost certainly at Le Platinier's instigation, he went on a study tour of Italy. And this took place in 1907. And one of the main intentions was to acquaint him, for the first time really, first hand, with Italian art, and certainly with sculpture, with architecture. And he spent uh, a lot of time studying the frescoes, and he spent a lot of time analyzing the architecture as well. And he arrived in Florence on the evening of Thursday, September the 12th, 1907. And, of course, he would very quickly uh, become familiar with these buildings. And he wrote home uh, to Le Platinier. And his letters of this time are, are very interesting. I've documented these in a, a book which I'm hoping to have published within the next year, uh, discussing these, these early years. Well, in Florence, he did a different kind of analysis uh, in the sense that he was looking at architecture, but it wasn't different in the way that he was penetrating what he felt to be important in whatever he was looking at. And this is the Bargello that we see on the near side. And you can see that he's um, got a series of notes which are alongside the elevation. And what we discover when we have those translated is that they're very ordinary notes indeed. There's nothing very remarkable there. He simply lists as a kind of inventory what is happening on the facade. He lists the incidents, he describes colors, and so on. He would usually, even though he colored the thing in, perhaps, on the sketch, he would also document the fact, because color, as part of nature, was important and had to be registered. He would also look, of course, at the column capital and would document that in a way that was appropriate with a 3D drawing in sort of perspective with shadow. And he does a detail of a window. And in his drawing of the baptistry, which we see on the far side, he uses a little uh, crayon to enliven that. Now, this is Siena, and this is not the main facade, which my photograph is of. That's his sepia watercolor, black and white illustration of the baptistry facade at the rear of Siena Cathedral. And that is an exquisite watercolor. And I think we sense when we look at these drawings uh, that his particular interest and fascination in anything was reflected in the quality of the drawing. And those of us who are most used to his drawings later on, of course, when he did a very shorthand and very relaxed, easy style, an almost childlike style, uh, one notes that he did have this technique in his early years and was a, a very gifted watercolorist. You can see on the top left how he does again a kind of postage stamp type summary of the main elements of the facade and how he details something else as well. Now that's Santa Croce, that's the um, church by Arnolfo de Gambio who worked on the cathedral at Florence before Brunelleschi did the dome and we have again here the sepia uh, drawing in perspective giving us an impression of the building which is just as important as these other analytical sketches where he's tracing as you can see the the roof trusses he's documenting all these things um, and on the near side we've got some heads drawn by Orcagna um, the Italian painter and I think what we sense here is something quite different and I, I, I'm always impressed by this enormous vitality in Jean Arre's perceptions, that he was exploring so many different avenues all at the same time, something he'd done with nature beforehand. He, he always tackled the thing in the way that mattered uh, in terms of what it was. And here we have a very dynamic drawing showing this oblique uh, thrust of the, across the, the drawing of these various heads. 
Now, on the near side, we're looking at something which uh, this large drawing here is another of these watercolors, Christ carrying the cross at Santa Maria Novella in the Spanish chapel. And what we have there is a backcloth that is architectural, animated by these figures, Christ carrying his own cross, and a whole lot of figures with spears and so on. And what we're sensing here is this contrast between the plane of the backcloth and the animation caused by partly the figures and partly these obliques. And I've just uh, documented a few sketches at the side there how the obliques uh, became very important to him in his work uh, in the um, Cinema La Scala in La Chaux de Fonds and in, of course, the first of the Citroën houses, the Maison Citroën, and indeed throughout his work in the ramps of the Villa Savoie and uh, at Chandigarh and wherever. Um, now, down below, if I can just focus this a little better, yeah, we've got... Um, this is the Ascension of St. John the Evangelist in the Peruzzi Chapel at Santa Croce. We've got the watercolour bottom right there. These are black and white, but these watercolours are in colour, rather nice. And what we've got here are, is an architectural framework, and the figures are inside the frame, but St. John, who's ascending uh, into heaven, is on, on the outside of this frame. He's ascending outside it. And, I mean, one doesn't make obvious... Uh, uh, simple cross-references and say that this directly inspired the Villa Savoie. But what one can note is that the Villa Savoie does have a framework, the orthogonal frame, and that there are things inside and things outside. He was informing himself of the whole language of art and architecture and three-dimensional and two-dimensional form on this tour. What we see on the far side um, is actually the death and funeral um, is of St. Francis. And what is happening there is, again, a symmetrical frame, which I've diagrammed at the bottom. Uh, the architectural framework is symmetrical. And then we have these figures around the coffin. And what he does there, you see, he, he draws that at the top left in one sense, and then he homes in on, on part of the composition, and then he homes in further on the group. And I hope that's in focus. I'll just see if I can do any better with it. But what we've got there is this telescoping in uh, so that he was uh, involved in the thing that interested him. Now, again, I think there's a comparison we could make with the Villa Savoie in terms of the organisation, because that, too, is a symmetrical framework. And, again, we have an, a whole series of asymmetrical incidents going on inside it. Now, that on the far side is some uh, discussion he did, an analysis of Or San Michele in Florence, very similar to what we've already seen. And on the near side, the Church of San Francesco at Fiesole, where he seems interested, you see, quite differently here. It's a vigorous sketch, and he's capturing the importance of the plane of this facade, the entry facade, and the way the bell tower, the campanile, uh, is attached and is again a plane. And there we have on this near side a more typical example of the watercolour uh, quality of these things. Uh, and then again another drawing on the far side. And here we have at Ravenna, we have San Vitale, a column capital on the far side, and San Apollinari in Classa. This is uh, the apse, uh, these, these Byzantine churches, which of course had been much praised again by Ruskin. And Ruskin's favourite building of course, was the Doge's Palace in Venice. Now, during this study tour, um, Jeanneret's perception of the architecture was through what he understood uh, about nature. It was a kind of filter uh, that, he, that he used because certain kinds of architecture, he believed, obeyed the correct natural laws. And there were correct natural laws in his view. Uh, for example, Romanesque architecture had a certain validity because it had structural integrity as he saw it. The structure, in other words, of Romanesque architecture was straightforward. Um, it was only what was necessary to the building. It was not elaborated upon beyond that. Now, Gothic architecture didn't obey that principle. It was unnecessarily high in uh, Jeanneret's view and had unnecessary elaboration, over-elaboration. Um, so the studies... This came via Ruskin. Ruskin explained 
uh, the importance, the moral importance of the integrity of architecture. And it was as a result of that that he was studying on the Italian tour medieval buildings, not the Renaissance, because the Renaissance, again, was a kind of um, icing on a cake. It wasn't, it wasn't really correct in, in Ruskin's view or indeed in, in, in January's view. Now, on his returning to La Chaux de Fonds, he designed a couple of houses that are on the top left of that sketch. The Stotzer house, immediate left, top left, and the Jack May house, and we see them here on the slope. You can see the Villa Falle that we've already looked at at the bottom. That slope is, the road is winding up, and on the far right we can see the parents' house uh, that he designed for his parents in 1912. These two houses were designed in 1908. Now, uh, again, he designed them in collaboration with René Chapelaz. And uh, this time, we sense that he's responding to the particular qualities of each uh, part of the site. Because the brief was identical, they were two houses on three floors containing on each floor a self-contained apartment where we have living accommodation, a bathroom, a bedroom, and a study, and a kitchen. And the entrances were from the far side, as I'm looking at it. They're south-facing, more or less, uh, on this side. And so we approach them from the end, they're symmetrical. So really there was not too much reason why they should have been very different from each other, but they are. And the explanation seems to be that the Stotzer house on the upper part of the slope is on a much more dramatic and steeper part of the slope. It's closer to the trees. The Jack May house is near the road. And they are really quite different. And I explain this in terms of the drama of the Stotzer house and the benign quality of the Jack May House. And the way that happens is if we look at Stotzer on the far side, we've got a much uh, more powerful roof form. The roof is cranked, as you can see. Uh, it has a, a dynamic feeling about it. Uh, that cranking and the linear thrust of the design is emphasized uh, by the whole configuration. We don't have, as we have here, we don't have these two uh, to anything like the same extent. Um, this building, the Jack May, has a softer overall feeling about it. It hasn't got the insistent rhythm of windows that we see in the Stotzer, and it has these uh, projections which give the thing a much more centroidal feeling rather than the acute linearity of the other. The way the balcony uh, occurs on the Stotzer, it doesn't occur here, is again a kind of stretching, a tautness is apparent in the building. And we also have curved, rather more feminine side walls here, as you can see, on this south-facing facade. And that's not the case on the far side. So if we just look at that, we sense these differences. We've got this, this wall, as I say, curving out on the, on the Jack May. And there we have this uh, Stotzer house on the higher part of the slope, uh, a much more powerful statement. And the sense of power, I think, is apparent in, in a number of ways. It's apparent in uh, the difference between this projection here, which is geometric and rather feminine and rather elaborate in the way the timbers are organized on that projection. Uh, in, in the other case, we, we don't have that. We have a stronger statement, uh, which we can see there on the far side. And, and that is just a, a slight projection, but a very strong statement of this barge board at the side. Uh, and here we see again the curve of the stonework and then we have this heavy rustication in the base to the Stotzer house. This is a cabinet that Jeanne Ray designed inside the Stotzer house. Now, having uh, explored those possibilities, uh, in 1911 he took off on the most significant of his study tours and this was the voyage to the Orient uh, which took him into some areas of great importance to him as he was developing. Uh, they concerned perception, uh, what we see, they concerned the intellect, and they concerned the emotions. Because man, as part of nature, he reacts to what he sees by means of his perceptual faculty, and that affects his heart, and it affects his mind. So what we see is important to us, how we register that, uh, as I say, is on the one hand emotional and on the other hand intellectual. And we can subdivide uh, his, his thoughts really into these two areas because the emotional part, he was, uh, 
entranced with peasant art and architecture. As he traveled through uh, the lands of the Eastern Mediterranean in Greece and Asia Minor, he became fascinated by the peasant uh, architecture. Uh, quite intoxicated by it, he, des he described peasant art as a striking creation of aesthetic sensuality. And he wrote the most beautiful poems about it, extolling the virtues of the whitewashed walls of these simple dwellings and extolling the virtues of the lifestyle of these people, which he saw, again, as uh, a correct uh, part of, of our experience in nature, in that one worked throughout this cycle of the day in the fields, one returned home to the, the, the village, and everything seemed correct and right and, 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 and harmonious. He saw certain cities as cancerous growths. Budapest, he described as a cancerous growth. He didn't like the pollution he saw there that was caused by a whole number of things, industrialization, uh, poverty, uh, and so on. So um, he believed that there was a pattern of life that could be at one with the cosmic forces apparent in the universe. And of course, this persisted in his thinking and led to the Radiant City and all those other proposals, the Ville Contemporaine later on. Well, on the other side of the equation, we have something else. You see, we've got the honesty, simplicity, and charm of, of the peasant art, and then we have the magnificent intellectual content uh, displayed in the Parthenon. And for Jean Array, the Parthenon was the greatest challenge. He pre prepared himself very carefully for his visit to the Parthenon. He, I think, had already decided before he went there that it was going to be the major experience of his life. On arrival at Athens, he delayed going up there. He arrived one evening and he waited until the following day to be properly prepared. And then he spent six weeks up there examining it. And he writes about it uh, in, in, in considerable detail. And he, he, he describes it um, as something which um, he couldn't actually uh, come to terms with. He was, he was defeated. He, he talks in, ter in depressed terms about the way this, this building had defeated him, that he, he couldn't really come to terms with it. He describes its iron quality, its precision, and the way it makes itself manifest uh, to all the surroundings. One is a, it's apparent as one uh, goes around it by sea and so on. And I haven't time to go into his, his full discussion of this. That would be another lecture. But it was for him a bringing together of the emotional and the intellectual components because he believed it had the capacity to move us. And it moved us because of the degree of intellectual control that was displayed here. And it was a discipline based, of course, on geometry. Now, all right, it was based on geometry. And also, he noticed that that was so with the mosques. And th this, too, was not just geometrical arrangement, it was to him logical arrangement of the kind I've described in Romanesque architecture. We have here, he felt, logical structure. Uh, we have the primary forms that he believed were important to our perceptual faculty because we can understand them so, so readily. They communicate with us directly. And so he became convinced that architecture was a question of forms revealed by light. His favorite mosque was the Suleimani, and that's one of his uh, sketches on the far side. And he wrote, he said, an elementary geometry is the discipline of the masses, the square, the cube, and the sphere. And when we look at his work, it's usually compact, uh, the Villa Savoie, typical, like that sketch that, you see again, he's taking a, an overhead perspective to really reinforce the whole idea of this building in his own analysis of it. Um, he wasn't able to, to get a view of it like that, but he was able to, to draw it like that. Now, when he returned to La Chaux de Fonds, thank you, he explored these ideas in uh, three houses, the villas Jeanne Perret for his parents, the one on the far side, 1912, the villa Favre Jaco in Le Locle, just along the valley from La Chaux de Fonds that we see here. And the other one was, of course, the Villa Schwab that he designed in 1916. Now, if we look at the parents' house first, what we see here is this house built on the side of the hill, and he establishes a terrace alongside it. As you can see, what he does now 
uh, is to develop the axis of the building in such a way that we project out a bay, a semicircular bay on one side, and we project out a rectilinear bay on the other. Now that rectilinear bay is at the correct end in the sense that there we have the flat facade of the building poised on the edge of a very steep slope. The semicircular bay is adjacent to the terrace that he forms next to the building. And what he's setting in motion here, he's already exploring these primary forms, the contrast of the curve against the, the cylinder, half cylinder against the cube, and he's setting in motion a whole train of thought that led him, of course, to the uh, Villa Savoie later on. There we see these two bays. There's this rectilinear bay ending the axis. There's the semicircular bay. And what he was doing, as I say, is setting in motion a, a, an exploration that led him eventually to the contrast between this curve of the Villa Savoie and the cubic form of the villa itself. Now, what we see here... Uh, again is I think a realization that it was possible to have a movement progression into the building that would enable us to fully uh, under not only understand it but to experience it in a memorable way. The whole idea of the promenade architectural is apparent in the first instance here in his parents house. Uh, an idea that was perhaps generated by going up the uh, hill of the Acropolis, moving through the Propylia and going past the uh, Parthenon. Because what we do here is something not dissimilar from that. We leave the road and we ascend through zone one on the far side and then we reach this terrace, we walk along it and then we move up a staircase uh, onto the zone two and then we walk past the building before entering in zone three at the back. Now this is what we do of course on the Acropolis as we move past the Parthenon. We see it three-quarter view as we do here as we pass it and we move along one of its main sides before entering at the back. If we just take that route now we can see how we've, we're on the terrace here. There's the three-quarter view. We move up the uh, staircase onto the terrace above the terrace adjacent to the house and there you can see how he's produced a kind of freeze on this uh, building. Uh, one is reminded of the Winslow House by Frank Lloyd Wright. He was familiar with Wright's work at this time. And uh, Wright's Winslow House has the same overhang uh, as this in, in principle. It has a frieze, differently treated admittedly, and it has this same symmetry and concentration uh, on that kind of uh, facade. We ascend this staircase, we walk across the front of the house past the bay, wind, past the bay and then we are taken into the house by the pergola, which forms its own axis, leading us in through an archway until we enter right at the back. And there we enter through this doorway, and you can see it on the far side. Once we reach the interior, we come into the grey zone on the diagram right at the far side there, and that grey zone is just the utilities. It's the hall and the kitchen and the study and the staircase. But the rest of it is more or less a grand space that was possible because he built four reinforced concrete columns to free himself of all the load-bearing requirements of a house of this kind uh, so that he could have one large space. And that is, in fact, what we have. Um, and this is the interior. And this is a house which they only lived in for a short time because his parents couldn't ever really afford it. Um, it's a typical story of the young architect who wants to make good persuades his parents to design, to, to, to have this house and they pay a lot of money for it. They lived in it only about three years. His mother used to teach the piano in that room uh, just there where we can see the bay that I've already looked at, the square bay. And uh, this is a porthole window in the, in the hall, uh, the earliest of uh, that kind of expression in his work. And there he's, there's his own study. Uh, which is a very nice affair and it's owned by a Monsieur Cornu who is a leading uh, uh, legal man and attorney in La Chaux de Fonds and it's uh, filled with his own objet d'art that he's got from, from Africa as you can see. Now down the valley the Villa Favre Jaco is a much more direct uh, statement of what he'd been discovering I think in Italy in the classical sense. Uh, we can sense a whole lot of things here that are perhaps almost Florentine um, what we have here, though, is this entry uh, by means of a turning circle of a motor car. The motor car becomes involved in the design in that sense, and we're embraced by these projecting arms as this house is poised on the edge of a valley. So that we are, as I say, um, brought into contact by this forward projecting screen, which is ahead of the main facade. What you can see on the far side is this classical pediment with the columns, and we have the column capitals uh, sculpted by uh, Leon Perrin, 
and they are our pigeons and acanthus leaves. Uh, again, a reference to nature. The corner pilasters are, I think, reminiscent perhaps of the work of Schinkel, and he'd seen Schinkel's work in Berlin when he went on a study tour from La Chaux de France. Um, so there we have the crispness of the corner articulation by Schinkel, and we have a feeling perhaps in colors and so on of the precision of Brunelleschi's work as well. Now, the Villa Schwab. This was designed four years later, um, in 1916. And this really represents the culmination of this early phase of his work. And he brings together his ideas rather more convincingly in this building than he had done in the first two. It's a house that was designed uh, and built entirely in concrete, and it's built within the gridiron pattern of La Chaux de Formes. We have this gridiron of streets, and there we can see the villa. It's known as the Villa Turk in La Chaux de Formes because it's so um, unlike everything else in La Chaux de Formes and more obviously inspired by the Byzantine architecture he'd seen on the voyage to the Orient. And here we see the corner where the villa is situated, steep slope, and there we see this symmetrical composition. Well, um, I guess my slides are, unfortunately, I, I should have checked this, they, that slide should have been over here, so one should always be reading them opposite way around. But we do start with our discussion of the building on the far side uh, in terms of its organization, because it is very much a kind of cube uh, within a half cube, as we see there. Um, some of the sources for it, of course, uh, we could consider the Thomas P. Hardy House by Wright as a, as a source in the way that the street facade locks onto the wall uh, of the street in the Hardy House, and the same thing happens in the Schwab House. Um, and, uh, the rest of the organization is not too similar. On the far side, though, if we look at that cube within a half cube, we can see that he's put a couple of apses onto it to extend the linear axis and that is the axis parallel with the road, the Rue du Doubs, which you see bottom right on that diagram. Um, so we've got the generic form of the square within the square, and that's changed now to a linear form. Now that's not dissimilar to Hagia Sophia, which he knew very well, and that of course is a kind of cube within a half cube in its main space to which we have these apses added on to make the linear axis. Now again, we have to start on the far side, where what he does next is to put this vertical volume across the other linear axis. So he's got an axis going at right angles to it. That vertical volume becomes the main interior space, but is linked to the lower space. Uh, it's not linked so much at the upper level, but the whole space sort of goes sideways and vertical. So what we've now got is a more complex space, which we can see on this side, where I've diagrammatized the effect of this central space with a balcony that you can see uh, shaded on this side. Uh, and the balcony has these curves on it. So that we, uh, we've got two curves, and that forms another axis across this way, which leads us to the two bedrooms. So that we enter from here, and we, uh, we, we then look down this balcony uh, through this vertical space, and we've got the window terminating that. At the ground floor, you can see where we come in on the far side, we, we come in more or less, uh, we come in here, and we've got it close, as you can see, the side of the thing. We come along, and we enter the ground floor in the middle, and we come into the open space of the living area, which expands uh, at either side. So if we look inside, you can see that he's again exploring uh, these contrasts between curves, the curves of the balcony, um, uh, within this rectilinear configuration, and he's doing it in quite an interesting way. There we see the upper balcony, we can see the curve plus the curve of the arch, the axis formed. And here we have this front facade. The staircase is along uh, the back of this facade, and those lights are illuminating the sides of the staircase as we ascend. Now, what is happening here, as it was in the Thomas P. Hardy house, is that we are locking onto the wall, as you can see on the far side, anchoring the building, as it were, into its setting. And then we have this roof terrace, the first of, of its kind that he did in his work, which is expanding around on the southern side where the sun is. And you can see my bottom right diagram. Those arrows are pointing to where the views are. And this projecting cornice, which is... Um, a device that he hadn't used before and I think was probably inspired by work by Hoffman uh, in, uh, in Vienna. He'd, he'd worked in, in, in Vienna 
and we have that fanning out on that side and we have this, this upper floor so we have a roof terrace. This was criticised of course in La Chaux de France as being something that would hold the snow which indeed it does when the more logical thing to do would be to have a pitch roof to shed the snow. Um, however, the composition is very much one of a, a concrete building with this veneer of brick as I've said and there's a certain precision about the way the, the windows are handled. You can see how we have the strip of brickwork and this is forming the windows themselves. And there's a view of the bay inside on the far side. Now, what I've summarized here um, are the various architectural principles that are already apparent now in his work at this stage of his career, 1916. Um, before he embarked on his modern architectural language, he already was doing many things which he later um, uh, described so well in Verian Architecture. Uh, for instance, you know, by the use of inert materials, starting from conditions more or less utilitarian, you've established certain relationships which have aroused my emotions. This is architecture, well, one of his statements. Uh, that's happening here. And then, of course, we have on the far side, we have mass. Uh, surface and plan, the exploration of all these things is happening. And on the near side, we have uh, the characteristics of his later work, the bold massing, we have the clear geometry, we have the site relationship, we have impact on the elevation, which are all apparent in his later work, surface modulation, a proportional system, some historic reference, which was usual in his work, and we have the spatial articulation now, quite sophisticated. The big difference from this uh, and his later work is in the fact that he's using symmetry, that he's not exploring in a dynamic way uh, the various parts of the building. He's not relating them in, in that sense. Um, he's not using a machine age language either. I mean, he's, he's restricted to something which is um, uh, not really all that uh, innovative. But if we go back just briefly and consider the fact that in 1914 he'd worked out with a friend, uh, uh, Max Dubois, a system known as the domino system, which they borrowed from a Swiss engineer, uh, and there's the principle of the domino with its slabs and so on. He was now acquainted with reinforced concrete and had worked for Auguste Perret, therefore believed that reinforced concrete was going to be the material, it was going to free architects from the responsibility of, of load-bearing materials, and therefore they could plan, plan freely. He didn't express that very well in, in his uh, domino houses uh, done during these years between 1914 and 1918. What I'm leading on to is something that um, next happened uh, with a competition that he uh, went in for for abattoirs. Um, and these were at Chalouis and Bordeaux. Now, once he got away from a domestic problem, he was into something else which involved a process, an industrialized process at that. So now he was able to use a far more industrial language. And um, he, as it were, at a stroke, acquired a real machine age language of industrial windows. He was able to use the uh, domino concrete system of slabs and columns, which he'd already got. And he was able to even uh, suggest in the building even forms such as an aeroplane form that we see here. And uh, he establishes, because you had cattle going into this building at one end, they then were killed, uh, slaughtered, and moved along on a conveyor belt coming out at the other end as tins of sausages, you see, that were then put onto trains. Uh, he got this complete um, statement of the integration of everything, including integration with the transport network. So you could even say that nature's part of this because the animals are part of nature. But what he got here, you see, was the idea that you could feed the animals in by a ramp. We've got a ramp here of a gentle can. We've got a rather more pronounced ramp on the far uh, building. But we've got a real functional statement for the first time. The only thing wrong with it this time is that it's symmetrical. He's still in a symmetrical straitjacket. Now, what then is apparent is this. That at this stage, we're talking now about 1916, 1917, when he entered the competition. He is still uh, going over ideas that have already been present in his work. He's not really inventing anything very much. Uh, this is the Schwab house, and it's not a lot different in its essential space, apart from the vertical part, to his parents' villa. 
And if we look at his work and compare it with that of Frank Lloyd Wright, if we look on the near side, all these buildings, 1906 Fallet, Favre Jacot, Jeanne Perry, they're all axial, they all have the cross axis, they all have one main facade, Stotzer, Jacquemet, and Schwab. They're all the same, really, with, with modifications. You think of what Frank Lloyd Wright was doing at this time in, in the houses he was doing, where we've got the Ward Willits house with the, the, the spiral movement and then uh, this tremendous pulling out of the axes uh, in, in, in other buildings by Wright. So he was um, operating in a completely different way, a far more inventive way. All this changed when Jeanne as a result of an unfortunate uh, lawsuit on his building, the Villa Schwab, where the client alleged correctly that uh, the building had cost far more than Jeanne suggested it would. Uh, there's a lot of unpleasant publicity about that. And as a result of many unfortunate things that happened to him in La Chaux de Fonds, inclu including the closing of the new section of the art school where he was a teacher, he, he decided he had to move away and go back to Paris, where he had worked for Perret in 1908, and um, he believed that's where his future lay. He met Amadeo aux Enfants at a coffee morning organized by Auguste Perret and very quickly started to learn from aux Enfants how to paint. The two of them formed this movement, Purism. They established the magazine L'Esprit Nouveau. The magazine L'Esprit Nouveau was an attempt to do two things. One, to explore the ideas of Purism, to bring together a lot of uh, people who could uh, extend this um, this movement, the new spirit, um, in various ways. And the other was to gain him clients because this was, this was produced and distributed throughout Europe. It did certainly uh, acquire clients for him. Well, what the purists were trying to do, Ozonfont and Jeanneret, and he met Ozonfont in about, I think he met him in 1918, and by 1920 uh, he, he had advanced from very simple arrangements that we see here of these objects, um, the pipes, the books, the objects which became the purest um, uh, canons of an idea that was evolutionary in the sense that everything evolves to a perfect form. Our hands are perfect because they've evolved that way. Uh, the book is perfect because it's evolved over time. A glass is perfect, a pipe is perfect. The other thing that the objects, the pure objects have, uh, the object da, um, is the object teep, I'm sorry, object teep, is um, that they are clear. So they are clear and yet they have the capacity for lyrical interpretation because when you get beyond that early stage, which he did here just a few years later, he got to this stage by 1920. I think these are just a little beyond that, but by 1920 he'd reached this stage. He was able now to explore compositions of a far more intricate kind, transparency, opacity, solid, void, uh, all sorts of intricate possibilities, abstraction and so on. And what the purists, Sozan Fawn and Janere, were trying to avoid, what they uh, believed was absolutely wrong, was the chaos and confusion of the Cubists. Uh, they reckoned that this, although it was a breakthrough in art, was not communicating, so they abstracted, they extracted rather, the, um, the pipes and the books, the various uh, motifs of Cubism, and they translated them into purist motifs. Well, at this point in time then, there was an obsession by Jeanne Array with evolving a machine age language. Um, Ozonfon had gone a long way in this direction, um, writing articles about, about the machine and designing machines such as the, uh, the motor car, I think the one that um, we see there. And one may say, well, what had happened to nature? But in fact, nature was always present in uh, the uh, beliefs of the purists because they were seeking universal principles. And they believed that natural organisms were clear in their forms based on geometrical structures. This is so in nature. So geometry should be the underlying discipline for both works of art and architecture. And so the relationship, again, between the emotions and what is perceived was important. And in this white cubic architecture of the 20s, we have the volumetric ensembles obeying what were believed to be the perceptual laws of purism, the perceptual laws we are all uh, involved in uh, as, as part of nature. And cubic and cylindrical forms are used because, as in the Parthenon, these shapes can communicate directly with our senses. 
and they aroused deep within us, as Le Corbusier wrote in Verin Architecture, they aroused deep within us a resonance, a sort of sounding board which begins to vibrate, an indefinable trace of the absolute which lies in the depths of our being. This is the um, L'Esprit Nouveau Pavilion which has been rebuilt at Bologna and that is the uh, La Roche uh, House in Paris. Well, the similarities between the buildings and the purest paintings, of course, are very obvious. There we have the Villa at Garche, here we have a purest painting, the same sort of interactions of shapes. And the paintings were always the area of exploration for uh, Le Corbusier. And there we have on the far side, again, Garche, and on the near side, Maison Cook. Um, and here we have the Aux Enfants studio apartment, um, which again is very similar in essence to the purest paintings. Well, the idea of impact was a technique that was already in being. We see it here in the Villa Fale, we see it in the Villa Stozza. The idea that this will leave its memory with us, the impact on us of a form. I, I suppose rather like the impact of anything on us, whether it's a beautiful face or, or whatever it may be, a dramatic uh, uh, sky or whatever. Um, another idea was the power of slab-like forms. But here, actually, I'm making the same point uh, of impact, which is uh, the one that we see on the Villa at Garche on the far side and on the Villa Savoie here. Um, the same idea that we'd already seen earlier. But this slab-like form idea uh, was used by Le Corbusier, I believe, because I, thought, I think he felt it expressed a noble idea. A noble idea, whether it be in the Pavillon Suisse that we see here, or whether it be um, in the Unites, or whether it be in the Villa Savoie, where the slab is turned on its side. But the slab became, became an important part of his armory. Another important part became the movement route, which we've, we've already seen, the promenade architectural, used in a sophisticated way in the Cité de Refuge, the Salvation Army building, and used in its first uh, mature realization in the La Roche house, where we enter in here into this entrance hall, and then we ascend, as I'm sure you all know, and we go across towards the, the gallery. We then go up the ramp and finish up in the library at the top of the building. And so we have really uh, something here where we are almost literally walking through a purist painting. We are, as it were, inside the painting. And this was a, a, a building designed to accommodate paintings, but it was also a series of planes and volumes and transparent, uh, transparency opacity uh, so that we are engaged in, in the purist idea. Um, I'm sorry that one of them there of the ramp is on its side. And I think we need to change the carousels, please. In these buildings, you see, the one we've just looked at, in all of them, the Villa Savoir is another, where the route is important, the Cité de Refuge. The route signifies the essence of the building, um, so that the experience on the route confirms the conceptual idea. This is another example of a similarity between the purest painting and works of architecture, where we see on the lower diagram the arrangement of these volumes in front of the Cité de Refuge, very similar to the uh, purest objects, the objet type, and the background of the guitars. Again, we've got background, foreground, as we saw in the frescoes, uh, but there is, I think, a very real uh, interplay going on here. So he explores ideas through this medium and then is able to translate them into buildings very easily. Well, the Corbusian perception of this relationship between architecture and nature became idealized in the culmination of the early houses with the Villa Savoie, uh, which is, I suppose, his most complete celebration of this idea of the, the, the idea of sun, space, and greenery, which preoccupied him throughout the 20s. Le soleil, l'espace, et le verdure. But this clinically logical machine age architecture uh, to which nature is accessible because that is a, 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 a platform from which we observe nature, um, but from which the villa remains detached. All this was to change, and towards the end of the 20th decade, we find that natural materials are now appearing. The machine is receding. The purest objects are receding. Something, something very important is happening. This is the breakfast room wall. 
Now we have natural stone. We also have natural stone in his own studio. There we see the studio, the end wall with the vault. And if we just look here, this little compartment, and you see the shelves on this side, uh, that is actually the compartment that he used uh, for his pencils. And that is the little window where he used to work, uh, glass bricks uh, preventing him from losing concentration. Natural forms now appear in the paintings. We have a dog, we have the human form. Uh, we are much less precise now. We are perhaps less logical and perhaps less sure of many things. We find that the piloti to the pavillon suisse are bone-shaped, as you can see them here. They're pulling out like a chest expander. And we find in the weekend house of 1935 the first suggestion of a new kind of architecture. He'd done this vault before. Um, he'd done it alongside his Citroen house in 1920. He'd done a, a cubic sort of Citroen house. And he'd done a vaulted one because the vault was always with him as an idea from his travels in Europe and Asia Minor. But now we have natural materials. We, 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 have, we have brick, we have grass on the roof, we have the glass brick as well. But we have this form now hugging the ground. We don't have it lifted above the ground. He did a whole series of buildings in the early 30s that were using natural materials in various parts of the world. All this culminated uh, in the 1950s in the Jowl houses. And um, the Sarabai house in India was built around. So what we find here now is an absolute reversal of the five points, the five points that he'd put on display in buildings like the Villa Savoie. You know, the free plan, the free facade, the fenetre en longueur, the ribbon window, and so on. He'd realized, I think, there'd been a number of problems with those houses, uh, problems of maintenance, problems of construction, uh, problems of flexibility in terms of lighting arrangements inside, and so on. He decided to abandon that architectural language completely. And he went for another kind of language, returning, I think, back to nature as source. Because what he's focusing on now is the family unit. And nature is seen in terms of the relationship between the parents who occupy one of these houses and their son and his family who occupy the other. I have a lecture in which I discuss this and it takes about an hour to explain the sophisticated relationship that goes on between these two houses. But there is, I think, an anchorage role of the main building occupied by the parents and there is uh, a relationship within the family between the two, which is established in the design. Uh, this linkage between the forms shows up from the very first sketches. I've, I've, I've uh, enough evidence to satisfy me that this is in fact the case. So he's back to the family now. In 1937, he wrote under the heading laws. He wrote the 30-day rhythms of the month, the 365-day rhythm of the year, the 24-hour rhythm of the day. These are the yardsticks of our lives. These are our time. These are our clock. Under the heading male and female, he wrote sun and water, active and passive, harmony, rivalry, conflict, a treaty of alliance, reproduction. And in the Jowl houses, I think the form is sculpted to express these kind of ideas. We're not now concerned with the machine. We are concerned with the rhythms of nature. We're concerned with linkages. We're concerned with the static and the dynamic. We're concerned with the drama of life itself. Rhythm now is expressed in the vaults. In his parents' house in 1912 that we see here, he designed this fireplace with birds on the tiles. Birds and flowers. 19, uh, 12-2, Favre Jaco house, he got the pigeons and the acanthus leaves. In this house in the 1950s, he has a bird's nesting platform that's projecting out between the vaults. He also has nature living, as he said, above the house, life goes on. The worms, everything that live in the soil. This idea of rhythms takes another form in the exhibition pavilion at Zurich of 1967 where he'd done a diagram of the 24-hour cycle which rises and falls. You may have seen the drawing. This building rises and falls in its roof form as well. Structural supports continue 
from his early days in that he just puts the support where it's needed and does it in the obvious way, which is what happens in nature. Nature doesn't do more than is necessary for structure. It does what is necessary. There we have the props in the Fallet house. Here we have these props holding up the balcony. We have props holding up the uh, Salvation Army building portico and we have a little prop holding up a balcony at the Maison Jam. Well, he described his research throughout his life as a patient search, and throughout his life he sought to discover through sketching everything that mattered to him. And that meant everything. He would sketch boats, a lot of sketches like this, where he shows the difference between a boat on the sand where the rope is like that, and what happens when the boat becomes, it floats, and that becomes taut, and how they all line up. I haven't got my slide of that sketch, but there is a sketch that shows them all in a line. He's perceiving those things. He's looking at very ordinary things, like the trees on the far side and garden-type uh, furniture, little simple chairs and so on. So he's recording everything. If we look at his sketchbooks, they go on all through his life. He's recording growth, structure, change, rhythm, certainly change, as we noticed earlier when he was drawing, uh, sketching the landscape in, in rain. His paintings change, they become far more turbulent. Um, they seem to reflect um, a view of life which was no longer, as I've said, certain. Um, there is a great power in both the paintings and the buildings of the later phase. And I think he became preoccupied, as I say, with the mystery of life, uh, with uh, uh, things that are beyond our understanding. In the 20s, he seemed to feel that he understood things. He felt that nature was, was paramount. These are sculptures that he had done uh, in America to, to, to his designs, and his work becomes profoundly sculptural. His understanding of nature was, of course, poetic. It wasn't a scientific understanding of nature. And he was always trying to balance the intellectual and emotional content of his buildings. But the real driving force was to involve the heart and to arouse the kind of passion for architecture that he'd felt, I think, as a young man when he went to Italy in 1907. And I'd just like to conclude by a quote. As I began with a quote, we'll conclude with a quote. He said, the great thing is to move men. Move them through the effect of a thousand incidences which illumine the soul, surprise it, fill it to the brim, irritate it, rouse it. Thank you very much.